Hello, this is Dr. Sean Standard, and we're going to talk about the ABCs of deformity correction, how to approach the deformity analysis in osteotomy planning. These are my disclosures. ABCs of deformity correction. So let's quickly review. What have we learned so far? Well, we've learned about axes, both mechanical and anatomic. We've learned about mechanical axis deviation and identification of deformities, joint orientation lines, joint orientation angles. So let's review our mnemonic map. Remember M stands for measure the MAD, A, analyze the joint angles, and then P, pick the deformed bone, which is sometimes more obvious than others. But what do you do now? You have the deformed segment. You should ask yourself, where, where is the deformity? Where should I cut the bone? And how am I going to correct the deformity and make it straight? Remember the ABCs. What are the ABCs? Well, first, you want to find the apex of the deformity. And this is going to be the center of the deformity and determine if the deformity has one or multiple apices. You want to do the B or bone cut, choose your level of osteotomy. This is the one thing that you are in control of as a surgeon and things such as local anatomic structures, local biology, mechanical factors will all play a part in this choice. C is perform the correction, you know, perform the deformity correction, whether acutely with certain techniques such as fixed assisted nailing or fixed assisted plating or gradual correction with classic circular frames or computer assisted hexapods. So let's talk about the apex. The apex is the center of the deformity and it's found at the intersection of the proximal and distal axes. The angle that is created is the magnitude of the deformity, 10 degrees in this example, and the apex marks the level of correction. This is where you want to work. This is where you want to create your bone cut to get a perfect alignment of both the bony margins and the axes. Each bone has a segment no matter how small. You can see in this example there's a large mid-shaft tibial segment but two smaller metaphyseal segments at each end, and they all have an axis. How do you find the apex? Where is the formerly? You perform axis, axis planning. You identify each segment's axis. When there is a deformity, there's going to be an axis and a segment proximally, and an axis and a segment distally. In this example, we find the proximal axis by using a mid diaphyseal line, the distal axis by a mid diaphyseal line, and X marks the spot, there's the apex, the magnitude's 10 degrees. So what is axis planning? You use this to identify each bone's segment axis. It's both mechanical and anatomic. There's frontal plane axis planning and sagittal plane axis planning. There's both femur and tibia and they're different. So if you're scratching your head, don't worry. This will all be covered in excruciating detail in the planning workshops. Well, let's just talk about the axis planning strategies. First, you can use a mid diaphyseal line if the segment is big enough. If it's a small segment, you can sub or create a normal joint angle as seen here, the very small segment in the distal femur. This is its axis by sub a normal 88 LDFA. Or you can use a normalized or normal segment proximal or distal and extend that line into the next segment marking the proximal segment of that bone. So now you find your apex. You know where the deformity is. Sometimes it feels like you have the tiger by the tail. So now you have to choose your bone cut the bone cut level should ideally be at the apex, but local anatomic and biological factors are going to play a, a part. You want to choose your osteotomy technique. Is it a multiple drill hole? That's very good in diaphysis. Giggly saws in the metaphyseal bones or in the foot, or even if you're creating precise cuts with a sagittal saw.
So the only osteotomy rule is make the osteotomy as close to the apex as possible. And this is what your choice as a surgeon is. You can't control where the apex is. You can't control the deformity that's presented to you, but you can choose your osteotomy level. You must remember if your osteotomy is at the apex, you're going to have perfect alignment of the axes and the bone margins. If your apex and osteotomy are not at the same level, you can still get perfect alignment of the axes, but your bone margins will be offset. And sometimes this is necessary called obligatory translation, and it can be acceptable or not acceptable depending on your analysis and plan. So let's talk about the difference between alignment of axes versus alignment of margins. So when the apex and the osteotomy are at the same level, in this example, we have created a plan. We've marked the apex. We've marked our osteotomy site at the apex. And we're going to hinge around our hinge point and then we get perfect alignment. The axes are aligned and the bone is aligned. However, that might not always be the case. But again, in this example, if everything goes your way, you can have a perfect example with, again, axes aligned and bone aligned. What if your osteotomy is away from the apex? Again, an example where we have our apex marked, we have our magnitude, and we've placed our osteotomy in the proximal aspect. You hinge around your apex, and what happens? You get significant bony malalignment. Now, interestingly, the axes are aligned, and theoretically, this is a adequate correction for the axis. But if you look at it at a clinical, that's not acceptable. You have minimal bone contact. You have a very large displaced fragment on the medial side of the lower leg. This is not going to work. Again, the closer you are to the apex with your osteotomy, the less it translates. Let's look at this example. Our osteotomy is a little closer. We hinge and we have offset but not as much. Can this be a clinically acceptable result? Possibly. If at the apex was an old piece of hardware, an old infection, a uh, previous pseudoarthrosis, then this margin heading into the lateral part of the lower leg could be clinically acceptable. That's going to be for you, the surgeon, to define. Let's look at the same example that we first saw with the osteotomy even closer to the apex. Again, osteotomy, hinge point at the apex, we rotate, minimal displacement, you have aligned axes, but the bone is not aligned. Now you can't see axes in the operating room. All you can see is bone margins. Many surgeons they create an error that they create the situation and they shift the bone over to get bone margins aligned. You've just created a translational deformity. So how do you predict how much translation you need? Well, let's look at this example. You have your apex marked. You have your osteotomy closer. The distance between the red and black line is going to be the amount of translation that occurs once you do your correction. And that can be predicted. And then you can decide if that is going to be acceptable. Why would anybody ever do that? Well, it's actually very common because the apex most often, especially in metaphyseal deformities, are not located in an accessible area for an osteotomy. You could be near a growth plate, or it could be a biological problem with questionable healing, or previous infection, previous pseudoarthrosis. The amount of necessary translation is dictated by the distance from the apex. It's controlled by you because you're picking your osteotomy site and the acceptability is variable.
how do you predict, again, the amount of translation? Well, if you look at the osteotomy site where you're choosing, the distance between the two axes, proximal and distal, at that level is going to be your amount of translation. So if you see the small little orange line, that's the amount of translation that's going to occur when I fix the bone. Again, small little orange line, that's my translation. And this is necessary. If you align those bones to make it look pretty, quote unquote, on the x-ray, you've created a medial translation and you'll offset your mechanical axis. Here's a Bone Ninja live example to demonstrate this. This is a Bone Ninja example to demonstrate the aforementioned principle of osteotomy site location versus the apex. If we first draw our axis of our proximal femur by simply running a normal mechanical axis of the femur into the proximal tibia, we then can draw our second line identifying our apex. Our apex is at the obvious deformity and measures 19 degrees. If we perform our osteotomy at the site of the apex and then place our hinge point at the same apex, which is on the correction level line, and perform a correction. You will see the alignment of both the bony margins and the axes. If we zoom in on this, you'll see how the bony margins have now aligned themselves. If we go back and we perform our osteotomy away from the apex, and again, rotate about the apex, you'll see that the axes are aligning, but the bony margins have now displaced. Theoretically, this is a correct deformity correction because the axes are aligned, but clinically this is unacceptable because of the very large prominence being created on the medial side of the tibia as well as minimal bone contact and other neurovascular considerations. If for some reason this apex was not an ideal place for a bone cut such as a previous infection, sclerotic bone, uh, retained hardware, if you perform your osteotomy as close as possible will have less offset. This is a Bone Ninja example to demonstrate the aforementioned principle of osteotomy site location versus the apex. If we first draw our axis of our proximal femur by simply running a normal mechanical axis of the femur into the proximal tibia, we then can draw our second line identifying our apex. Our apex is at the obvious deformity and measures 19 degrees. If we perform our osteotomy at the site of the apex and then place our hinge point at the same apex, which is on the correction level line, and perform a correction, you will see the alignment of both the bony margins and the axes. If we zoom in on this, you'll see how the bony margins have now aligned themselves. If we go back and we perform our osteotomy away from the apex, and again, rotate about the apex, you'll see that the 
axes are aligning, but the bony margins have now displaced. Theoretically, this is a correct deformity correction because the axis C's are aligned. But clinically, this is unacceptable because of the very large prominence being created on the medial side of the tibia, as well as minimal bone contact and other neurovascular consider considerations. If for some reason this apex was not an ideal place for a bone cut such as a previous infection, sclerotic bone, uh, retained hardware, if you perform your osteotomy as close as possible, you'll have less offset. And the amount of offset can actually be calculated between the distance between the red and green lines. And so if we now hinge with our osteotomy minimally displaced, you'll see the axis lines align and the displacement is less and possibly clinically acceptable. Might have to take off a little bone if it's prominent, if it's a larger patient, should not be a problem. You can continue to experiment with this with multiple osteotomy levels and hinging around the apex. So let's look at this example. We first identify our apex in the distal femur. You can then choose your osteotomy site and also predict your necessary translation. With that information, you can re reproduce the same pattern in the operating room and be assured that you're going to have the result that you planned, normalizing the LDFA to 88 degrees. So the correction is the final step, and it can be an acute correction, such as aligning the imaginary axes to create normal joint angles and a normalized mechanical axis, or a gradual correction using hinge correction with a classic circular frame, or a 3D correction with a computer-assisted hexapods. You can also recreate the preoperative plan because, like we said before, there's no lines in the operating room. You have imaginary lines, but if you can create a plan, understand the joint angle that you want to achieve, predict the translation, and then you achieve that in the operating room. This is an example of a significant varus deformity. And if you look at, this is an example where there is a coronal soft tissue component with medial collapse and lateral joint laxity. And so if you would normalize the joint line congruency angle, like we've done in the second image, you then see the exact bony correction that you need. So from image two to three, you've normalized the joint line congruency angle, understanding that if you correct the mechanical axis in the coronal plane, that ligamentous laxity will resolve for the most part. So now I can see where my apex is, how much translation I need, my planned osteotomy site, and the correction I want to achieve. There are my angles that I want to achieve, and I'm going to overcorrect the proximal tibia due to the changes already in the medial compartment. This is what I hope to achieve. This is the pattern that I'm going to the operating room with. And we're going to reproduce this plan. Here's the fluoro showing the planned osteotomy site. Fixture assisted plating method. Osteotomy. Correction. Reproducing the intended joint angle.
pre-op, pre-op plan, and execution. And this can all be done with deformity analysis and deformity correction planning. So what about C, the correction? For the gradual correction, you must identify the correction level, place a hinge point, or what we call the thumbtack, the TT, on that correction level, and rotate your osteotomy around the hinge point. This will align your proximal and distal axes. And so as we look at the deformity correction around hinge points, the important thing to remember is a hinge or TT must be on the correction level line. So what, what is uh, in gradual correction, what is the correction level line? Well, we find our apex, as we've done before, and we create our correction level. And the correction level is simply a transverse bisector of the obtuse angle, uh, the apex. You place your thumbtack anywhere along that line, and you're going to get perfect alignment of both the axes and the bone margins. So the absolute rule, right? The hinge point must be on the correction level line. So the rules that we have come up with is the osteotomy rule. Make your osteotomy as close as the apex as possible. And the absolute rule of the hinge point, it must be on the correction level line. What is the correction level? Again, it's simply a transverse bisector drawn through the apex or the obtuse angle. If you look at this example, you can see that the apex in deformity magnitude is 14 degrees, creating an obtuse angle of 166 degrees. Therefore, you should draw a line creating two 83 degree angles. That's a transverse bisector. That's your correction level line. Again, if you look at this apex, our osteotomy site is going to be at this level. And this is our correction level line. Again, the transverse bisector up of the obtuse angle. What happens if the hinge point is on the convexity side of the deformity along the correction level line? When this happens, you're actually going to get realignment and distraction or lengthening. If you are on the concave side of the deformity and you rotate about the hinge point, you're going to get correction of both the bony and axis and compression or shortening. So let's look at the three different positions. On the convex side, you correct, yields an opening wedge and lengthening. The concave side creates compression and shortening. You still see the obligatory translation in both examples because the osteotomy is away from the apex. What if it's right in the middle? Well, this will be a neutral wedge type correction where you invaginate the corner of the metaphysis into the diaphysis. Very stable construct. So convex side, opening wedge. Concave side, closing wedge. On the apex, neutral wedge osteotomy. Still, all of them achieving the necessary or obligatory translation due to the fact that the osteotomy is away from the apex. So this is a old figure showing those three positions, convex, neutral, and concave, creating opening, neutral, and closing wedges. What if you don't follow the rules? There could be some problems. So what if the hinge point is away from the correction level? And this is going to simulate one of those monolateral ball joint things. And you hinge around that hinge point that's away. You align the axes, but they're offset. And you've created a translational deformity. What if you place it on the concave side? And again, off the correction level line. Again, you have compression and bony offset translational deformity. What if the hinge point and osteotomy are away from the apex? This pretty much simulates someone who didn't go to the course. And you can see this crazy deformity that is not uncommon, especially in Blount's treatment. This is a, a large young man on one of my mission hospitals. 
And you can see someone has, you know, with good intentions, tried to correct this deformity, but instead they have created a double deformity. They've created a varus, a valgus, and an extremely large translational deformity. And these can be very challenging, you know, to correct. You have to translate, you know, this bone over 50% and take into consideration the perineal nerve and other factors. So you want to follow the rules. So thumbtack is not on the C level. It's very common to hinge around your osteotomy and not the apex. If you see this deformity of 14 degrees, we want to correct this varus by correcting the 14 degree magnitude. If you hinge at the osteotomy site, first, you're not creating that obligatory translation that needs to happen. You've, you've created a translational deformity medial and an undercorrection of the angulation resulting in the mechanical axis still being medial. And if this person did have lateral joint laxity, they're going to fall right back into that significant varus created by that lateral collateral laxity. So what happens is that, well, I need more angulation. And a surgeon who doesn't understand these concepts will then overcorrect the osteotomy to make up for this translational deformity. And what happens? Well, you, you do correct your mechanical axis, but you throw off your ankle, and now you have an abnormal LDTA with impingement and pain at the ankle. So this overcorrection creates a secondary problem. You know, how real is this? I've seen it multiple times. This is a young man, femur is corrected, extended the axis into the proximal tibia, we see the apex in the bone cut, right? So the bone cut is there, the correction level is there. If we hinge on the apex, then you have perfect alignment. The bone has to translate. You have a normalized mechanical axis, maintained ankle normality. If you hinge at the osteotomy site, again, away from the apex, the same thing's going to happen. You're going to have a translational deformity. Well, we can fix that just by overcorrecting. Now you've created an LDTA of 74 degrees with impingement and ankle pain. Here's another Bone Ninja example to illustrate this. The Bone Ninja example, demonstrating the principles of the correction level line to create a opening, neutral, or closing wedge osteotomy, or what happens when you hinge away from the correction level line. And we'll start by drawing a normal mechanical axis of the femur and extending it into the proximal tibia, denoting the proximal tibial axis line. We'll draw another simple mid diaphyseal line distally, representing the distal tibial axis. This gives us our apex of deformity, measuring 160 degrees. So I'm going to use my purple line and create an angle that's 80 degrees. And that will now be our correction level line. If I make my osteotomy at a reasonable level, which will be below the apex due to the bone consideration, you'll see the distance between the red and green line will be the amount of necessary translation that occurs. I then place my hinge point on the apex and I perform my correction. My axis line has now been reduced and I've created a neutral wedge osteotomy in the fact that I was centered on the apex. If we look at it a little bit closer, you can see that the bone margins have offset in a necessary fashion, but the axis are perfectly aligned.
if we then perform an osteotomy even closer, this will decrease the amount of obligatory translation as the deformity is being corrected. Less offset. If we rotate, since this patient's standing on a five centimeter block, along the correction level line, but on the convexity, you're going to see the correction and the lengthening taking place. Now we have perfect correction and additional length. This is hinging on the convexity along the correction level line. If we do the same correction, but I place my hinge point on the concavity, you're going to see a significant shortening or compression at the osteotomy site as the lines realign. That is hinging on the concavity of the deformity, creating compression or shortening. If we make our osteotomy again at an appropriate location, but we hinge not on the correction level line, but somewhere in space on the convexity, you're going to get an apparent correction, but an offset. And you can see how the axes are now offset. If we test our mechanical axis, which is the red line, you'll see that we're created a varus position due to medial offset. So again, the principle is to always hinge neutral, closing, or opening wedge along this correction level line, which is simply the bisector of this angle. Again, let's create a lengthening and equalize this patient's leg lengths with perfect alignment, lengthening, and completion. Thank you. The bone ninja example. So, remember the rules. The apex is the intersection of the axes. The osteotomy should be as close to the apex as possible. The correction level is a transverse bisector of the apex, and your hinge point must be on the correction level line. So these are the rules. And with these, you'll never go wrong and you'll have perfect corrections. Just remember the ABCs. Thank you.